Whenever I talk about a sub $100 handheld, there is bound to be somebody in the comment section that talks about this guy, the R36S. Now I've had this handheld for quite some time. I just, I haven't had a chance to actually, you know, play games on it and test it out and see whether or not this was something that I would recommend. And now that I've finally had some time to actually form an opinion and whether or not this was something I would recommend, I've got to say that there are a lot of things that are working for this handheld, but there are definitely some things that you should take into consideration if you're considering getting getting an R36S for yourself. Now you can find this handheld in several places online, but the main places that I recommend people go to are either AliExpress or Amazon. AliExpress, of course, you can find it relatively inexpensive in comparison to the resellers on Amazon. On AliExpress, you're gonna find it for anywhere between 40, 45, sometimes even $50. And in most cases, you do get free shipping with that. On Amazon, you are going to have resellers that go ahead and, you know, pretty much resell whatever it is they, they buy. And you're going to find it for anywhere between 79 and $89. But the beauty of it is that you do have Prime there and the return process through Amazon is relatively quick. And uh, aside from, you know, taking it to a UPS store or whatever it is that you're going to return it to Whole Foods or whatever, it's uh, relatively seamless. With AliExpress, you do have returns that, you know, you can do, but it's just a longer, more tedious process, at least in my opinion. In terms of the colors that are available, you you do have an all white option, which is cool just to kind of have that all white look, but they also have a transparent purple and they have a transparent black, just like the one that I went for for my unit. Now I do have to say, I love the design of this box. I mean, it's pretty cool. It's full of character. And I mean, Goku's literally just chilling there right on the front. Um, I do have to say that on the inside though, it was pretty straightforward. I was expecting this to be kind of like wrapped in plastic or something, kind of like the Amberdick devices, but this was just literally chilling there with a little bit of foam on top. Underneath that, though you are going to find an r36 manual which underneath it says the rgb 20s instructions and <laughs> after a little bit of research it seems that the r36s literally ripped off the rgb 20s and i'm guessing that's how china you know free market works over there um, but underneath that you are also going to find a screen protector with a couple of wipes to prep that screen for installation and then a usb a to usb c cable for either you know data management or just plugging it in to charge in terms of specs, you're going to get the Rockchip RK3326 as well as one gigabyte of DDR3L RAM. The screen is 3.5 inches and is 640 by 480. And the battery that you get is a 3200 milliamp hour battery. Now, I will say that on the back of the box, it does say that this handheld does support 2.4 and 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi. But in my testing, that just didn't happen. I don't know if that was just an error on my part, but I also decided to go ahead and use a USB dongle to see if I could get some Wi-Fi and it just didn't register at all. All right, let's do a quick tour of this handheld. So on the front side, you're gonna find this D-pad that's right here and the D-pad feels fine. I do want to go ahead and say that it just feels like that pivot that's there isn't that great, especially in comparison to the RG35XX or even the MiU Mini Plus. It just, I don't know, leaves a little bit to be desired. Now, when you do go ahead and go into a regular direction, one of the four up, down, left, right directions, it's fine. But when I try to go ahead and do a diagonal for any reason, I just have issues uh, with that kind of just register you are going to have two analog sticks that are here that are very reminiscent of the Joy-Con joysticks. You have start, select button, and a function key, as well as your mono speaker. And then you also have these face buttons that actually feel really great for the price point. I'm actually kind of surprised with how nice they actually feel. On the backside, you're gonna have your R1, R2, as well as your L1, L2. And this, at first, when I first saw it, I thought that it was going to be exactly like flush, like it's gonna be very reminiscent of the RG35XX. But when I actually started using it, I noticed that there's a little bit of a raise on your L2 and your R2. It just feels a little bit more comfortable and ergonomic because of that raise. With the RG35XX, it's just a straight line. You just have nothing to, you know, kind of like grip on and you kind of have to go ahead and have like a really hard like angle in order to play the game. But here you can rest it and it's a little bit more comfortable because your uh, L2 and R2 are raised up a little bit in comparison to everything else. On the right side, you are going to have your volume rocker as well as this, this SD card that's right here is actually meant for your OS. On the left side, you are going to have this SD card that is meant for all of your games. You have a power button and restart button. And on the bottom side, you have uh, your 3.5 millimeter jack as well as your DC. This is meant, this USB port is only meant for charging, nothing else. The OTG uh, USB port that's here is meant for transferring files or data transfer. I don't really know what these uh, holes are for. Um, I guess maybe ventilation, I don't really know. Um, and on the top, you've got absolutely nothing. On the back side, I will go ahead and say that I love the fact any anytime that uh, a retro handheld has 
uh, this here that you can go ahead and remove this detachable door to protect your battery. I like that because if the battery, you know, is a dud or for any reason starts dying down, it's a very easy swap in comparison to, you know, having to go ahead and take off everything on the back, remove it, swap that out. And it's just, it's a hassle. I don't want to deal with it. I'd rather just have it be nice and easy in comparison to everything else. But in the grand scheme of things, I do love the layout of this. I will say that when it comes to the ergonomics of it, this, I, I run into the same issue that I ran into the RG353V. Whenever I'm actually using it, I feel like I might actually just, you know, these analog sticks, when I push them down, I feel like I might, you know, kind of like lose a uh, handle on it. Thankfully, most of the time I'm, I'm playing like this whenever I'm playing 3D titles, but I do love 16-bit and 8-bit titles. So whenever I'm playing those, I'm typically playing with just the D-pad and the face buttons, and I'm not really having to worry about anything else when I'm playing these games. When it comes to the R36S, there really isn't that much that I own personally that I can compare it to. The closest thing that I have that I can compare it to in terms of ergonomics and everything is actually the RG353V from Amberdick. Uh, I mean, it's pretty similar in terms of like how it feels and everything. I Like I said earlier, I do like the fact that these actually, these buttons actually kind of lead towards like a little bit of a curve. I just prefer curves over like this flat stuff that's here going on like i just i don't know i like to have like an actual grip and feel things feel ergonomic but in terms of like pricing performance and everything else the rg353v is more expensive it definitely uh performs a little bit better than the um r36s but at the end of the day it really just depends on what it is that you want to go ahead and go for now in that price point of that sweet sub hundred dollar maybe 50 60 maybe 40 dollars when you're comparing it to this the closest things that i have that i can go in and compare it to are the rg 35XX Plus and the MiU Mini Plus. Now, obviously, this is much larger and uh, has analog sticks, so it plays better when it comes to 3D titles. But in terms of sizing and just the way that it feels, I just, this is awesome. I like the fact that you have like an actual like grip to everything and you can play those 3D titles that you want to if you decide to go ahead and go for that. I personally prefer to play 8-bit uh, and 16-bit titles, um, and that's probably why I prefer the size and feel of the MiU Mini Plus in comparison to everything else but if you're in the market for any of these it really just depends on the overall size how much you want to go ahead and spend and the feel and which games you are going to be playing in contrast to everything else my experience with the OS is not that great. Um, when the handheld arrived, it was pretty much dead on arrival. And uh, there were so many things that I tried, different button combinations to just get this handheld to boot up. And because I waited so long to actually review this, I couldn't return it. Uh, so I was out of the return window. But when I would go ahead and try to boot it up, it would kind of be like this, where like this LED light would go ahead and turn on and that would be it. The screen would remain blank. At this point, it's fine. If I go ahead and I turn on the power, it will go ahead and boot up just just fine because I updated the software, but I'm assuming that it's because of the fact that, that this SD card was in this handheld. Now, a lot of people, they've mentioned it in the past. I've mentioned it as well. The quality of these SD cards are crap. The moment that you get them, you're better off just backing it up on another SD card, flashing whatever it is that you have there on another SD card just to back it up because these are prone to failure. They're just the cheapest of the cheapest. And whenever I connected this to my computer to see what was going on, it would just become a worse and worse and worse experience experience at the end of it all it just didn't even connect it didn't even actually register on my pc so i grabbed a 32 gigabyte card that i had lying around and i flashed arc os the latest version of it onto that sd card now there are a couple of things that you should pick up for yourself before we actually start working on arc os for the r36s first and foremost i recommend getting an sd card something from a reputable brand that isn't this cheap stuff that is in this handheld i definitely recommend either sandisk or samsung those haven't given me any issues at all and if you want to Toshiba is also a very reputable brand as well on top of that I do recommend getting Belena Etcher this is a software that's used to essentially flash whatever it is that you want onto an external storage or internal storage of some kind and in this case a micro SD card on top of that I do recommend downloading the R351 MP version of Arc OS I have links in the description for all of this stuff as well as a specific file that the developer went ahead and posted that is tied to the R 
R35S performance of the Arc OS. This works fine on the R36S and I haven't ran into any issues after installing this in my handheld. If this is the first time that you've ever flashed anything onto an SD card, I know that this might seem a little daunting, but it's actually really easy. Open up Elena Etcher and after that, select the file that you downloaded from GitHub, that Arc OS file. From there, make sure that your SD card is chosen and just flash. You'll get a little prompt that comes up if you're using Windows and just, you know, go ahead and say, yes, I want to go ahead and do it. From there, you'll go ahead and have to wait a few minutes while it's actually flashing that OS image onto the SD card itself. Once it's done, all you have to do is actually pull out the SD card from your computer and plug that back in because we have to go ahead and get that second file onto that SD card. Once you plug in that SD card with ArcOS Flash onto it, it'll pop up and there's going to be a file that reads RK3326-RG351MP-Linux.DTB. That specific file, you want to go ahead and copy onto your actual computer's hard drive. This is just to back it up in case there's any issues when you flash that new file onto that SD card. Go back to that downloads folder and you're going to find the zip file that reads rk3326-rg351mp-linux.zip. Go in there and you're going to find what looks like an exact copy of that file that you took from the SD card. Drag that over, say that you want to go ahead and replace the file that's there. And once that's done, eject that card and plug that back into your R36S. Now that everything is flashed onto the card, all you have to do is take that SD card out of your computer and put that into your R36S unit. It, boot it up and ArcOS will go ahead and start the installation process. It takes a few minutes for everything to go ahead and install, but once it's done, it'll boot right into ArcOS, but we still have a few more things that we have to do. ArcOS by default looks at that same SD card that has the custom firmware installed for the actual games themselves. In order to go ahead and switch that, you need to go into options, go into advanced, and scroll all the way down until it says switch to SD2 card for ROMs. Once you go ahead and click that, it'll go ahead and start and initiate a whole process that looks like that original installation, but it'll boot up relatively quickly. And from there, you'll be able to access all of the games on that second SD card. Before we start talking about the software and the different things that you can do with this handheld, I would recommend enabling quick mode. In order to do that, you have to go into the options menu from the main menu. From there, go to advanced and then enable quick mode. After that, it'll ask you if you actually wanna go ahead and do this and you say yes. A bunch of code will pop up on screen and then after that, it'll reboot Arc OS. You won't really see the benefits right then and there from the get-go, but we'll talk about that more later on in the video. If you're not familiar with Arc OS, there are a couple of shortcuts that you can use to kind of just make your gaming experience a little bit better. All of it's tied to this R3 joystick that's down here. So if you hold this down and you push up or down on the D-pad, you'll be able to go ahead and adjust the screen brightness on the fly. Also, um, if you want to, you can put the game to sleep or the uh, handheld to sleep just by pushing this down. Now with the LED light that's here, as you can tell, it is in sleep mode. So while this uh, handheld is in this mode, you're still going to be drawing a lot of power. Uh, it's nice because, you know, if you want to go back, all you have to do is just push it and it'll go ahead and boot back without ha having any issues. And it's relatively quick. But if you are, if you just want to kind of like pause whatever it is that you're doing and you want to uh, have an extended period of time uh, in between your play sessions, then that's where this uh, quick mode uh, being enabled comes into play. So if you hold this joystick and you went, go ahead and hold the power, see how it kind of went ahead and turned off. It shuts down Arc OS and has like a save state for the last game that you were playing. So you don't have to worry about anything. Thing. And if you want to turn it back on, you hold the power button. Arc OS will go ahead and start booting up once again. But the cool thing about it is that it boots up and then it takes you right back to the ROM or the last game that you were playing and loads the save state that they just had as it was shutting down. So give it a second and boom, it'll go ahead and turn on and boom. That way you don't have to worry about anything. If you want to go ahead and exit the emulation, you can go ahead and do so by hitting start and select twice. But there are other things that you can do in RetroArch specifically that are tied to this. Now, I spent most of my time gaming on RetroArch. So um, if you want to go ahead and do specific things there, you can, for example, bring up the menu. You just hit push select and uh, X and it'll go ahead and come on and off. And then after that, if you want to go ahead and pause the emulation, you can hit select and A and it'll uh, do that push it again to unpause. If you want to uh, create a save state, all you have to do is hit select and R1, and there's your save state. And if you want to go ahead and load that save state, select and L1, 
and it'll go ahead and load the save state that you have right then and there. If you want to re uh, reset or restart the emulation for any reason at all, just select NB and boom, it'll go ahead and it'll just reset. And again, we can just load right back in where we were. If you want to exit, like I said earlier, you just got to hit start and select at the same time and one more time and it'll exit out and take you back to the Arc OS main menu that's there in emulation station. Honestly, all of these work really well um, and I haven't really had any issues with it, especially after updating the Arc OS software. Now, obviously, if you want to go ahead and get this handheld for yourself, you want to play some of the games from your childhood on here or experience new titles that you missed out on in your childhood. The experience of playing some of these games on this handheld varies depending on which platform it is that you're going to be emulating. Obviously, things that are 8-bit, 16-bit titles, they just they run fine. You don't have anything to worry about. We're talking about Nintendo, Super Nintendo, uh, Game Boy, Game Boy Advanced, uh, Sega Mega Drive. Um, even some of the titles that are there for the PlayStation just they run fine. It isn't until you actually go into heavier hitting titles on the PlayStation or uh, Dreamcast, N64, even some PSP titles kind of make this handheld uh, go onto its knees. It just has a rough time processing and rendering some of the images that are there. Now, don't get me wrong, on the PSP, there are some titles that run just fine. For example, I was playing Soul Calibur on there, no issues at all whatsoever. But when I started playing Tekken Dark Resurrection on PSP, I started running into a couple of problems. I had frame skipping turned off in PPSSPP, and then when I started playing, it just was all over the place in terms of performance. I would start a match and it would drop all the way down to 20, 30 frames per second when it's supposed to be a smooth 60. And eventually the emulator was like, hey, listen, you're losing a lot of frames and there's poor performance. Maybe you should try <laughs> turning on frame skipping, which I did. And that actually helped a little bit but even still the emulator as well as the handheld had a tough time reaching that 60 fps mark and staying up there but when it came to n64 titles that's where things kind of just I don't know, got a little wonky. But this is because RetroArch is actually the one that's emulating N64 games in it instead of a standalone emulator that is included on this handheld. In order to switch that to get a better experience, you want to go ahead and push start while looking in the N64 menu, go to emulator settings, and then from there you can change the emulator to standalone Rice. This will provide the best experience possible for roughly almost all of the games that are there. Now, obviously, it is still going to run into a few problems just because of hardware limitations, but the overall experience is going to be much better than using RetroArch. When it comes to Dreamcast, that's where things kind of just go ahead and slow down to a halt. I mean, it's difficult for some of the games that are there to hit that 30 FPS mark. When I was playing Crazy Taxi, I just had issues going to and from. It was almost constantly around 25 to 28 frames per second. And even with everything going into that game, it was still fun. It was still enjoyable. But if you want a smooth experience, you're just not going to get it when emulating Dreamcast titles on this handheld. So obviously when it comes to playing 3D or at least heavy 3D titles, this isn't something that I would recommend for this handheld, but if you are going to be playing some of those titles on N64, Dreamcast, and so on and so forth that are from that era, you would probably want to stick to 2D titles. It's just, it, they run better unless you're okay dipping into that 30 FPS or even lower to that mid 20 FPS for some of these titles. If you're okay with you know that, then you're fine. Go ahead and go for it. For me personally, I prefer to have the smoothest experience possible. So if I can get 60 FPS, on some of these titles i'm gonna go ahead and go for that when i'm playing on these now i've said this before on the channel and i'll say it again i prefer to play 8-bit and 16-bit titles on these retro handhelds more than anything else but it is definitely nice to be able to go ahead and play some of those titles from ps1 n64 dreamcast and psp on this handheld despite at least for psp some titles just being phenomenal while others not running well at all so who is the R36S for? Well, there are a lot of things, a lot of pros, a lot of cons when it comes to this handheld, but one of the biggest pros that I have to go ahead and pretty much praise it for is that price point at 40 or $50, depending on whether or not you get it on sale or not. Like this is just, it's too hard to ignore. And the quality that you get for that price point, just again, too hard to ignore. Obviously, this is something that I would recommend to somebody that is starting to get into retro emulation and wants to kind of learn a little bit, tinker a little bit. But even still, for a seasoned pro or somebody that is used to everything, this is honestly a solid go-to experience. Now, this is not without any caveats. I want to go ahead and let you know that there are some instances that you might run into problems. For instance, my unit just came and it was dead on arrival. So if you're afraid of tinkering with things or afraid with messing with things, this might turn you off from any further retro handheld emulators in the future, even if it does interest you. So if you're willing to go ahead and part with 40 or $50, this is definitely something that I would recommend 
recommend to anyone that is interested in retro handheld emulation. So what do you guys think of the R36S? Is this something that you're interested in? Is this something that you already have for yourself? Or do you have any tips and tricks that you can share not only with me, but other people in this community? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on things. And if you wanna hear my thoughts on the RG35XXH, click this video over here. And if you wanna hear my thoughts on the RG35XX+, Plus, then click this video over here. And until next time, guys, I'll see you on the next one. Peace.